Hello folks, Phil Gallagher of Thraben U here for a just kind of short, maybe hour long video. I'm going to play a little bit of Historic today. Um, I specifically have something that I want to test. So on stream the other day, I played some of this Historic Life Gain deck and I'm doing pretty well with it. I've ground my way up to, I think, the middle of Platinum. Um, but I want to make some changes. So I need to hit this down arrow, sorry. So last time around, I was playing this Alcaid of Life's Bounty, and it was fine, but as I'm playing more and more, I'm noticing a problem with it. So this is a deck that wants to tap out and use its mana optimally just about every turn. So an ideal curve looks something like Soul Warden into a Johnny's Pride Mate into Linden or Heliod. And if instead you're playing this Alcaid on turn one, you're not going to hold up mana on turn 2, and you're probably not going to hold up mana on turn 3 for this most of the time. So rather than being a protection spell like something along the lines of Mother of Runes or Giver of Runes that we might see in other formats, this ends up being more of an Alpha Strike card, like your opponent only has green blockers or red blockers, and then you give your Johnny's Pride Mate protection from that color, and you crash in and you get the kill. But there's kind of an issue with that. So, number one, the Alcaid is not serving as a protection thing. Number two, if you give your creature pro whatever color your opponent has as their only creatures, and you attack in, and in response to you trying to give it protection, they have a combat trick, you get pretty savagely two for one, and you probably lose that game. So I'm not sure that this card is actually supposed to be in the deck, and so I'm going to cut these from the deck and instead play the full playset of Healer's Hawk. And I know this card doesn't really look like it's anything special, but it's an evasive card that I can stack counters on for Heliod, and it's more consistent at being able to attack in on turn two in order to grow an Arjani's Pride Mate or a Hollowed Priest. Um, so let's play a handful of games with this and see how we go. Conveniently, I get gold today for casting white spells. But let's see how this feels. Okay, um, we have a fine hand. Like, we have a great hand now. So, generally speaking, Soul Warden tends to be the best one drop to play. Oh, I haven't played against a Baral deck before, um, so my opponent is probably going to be um, along the combo axis of some kind. Alright, uh, so my payoff card is gone now, so current plan is to get to 27 life some way or another to enable Speaker of Heaven. Um, I do that next turn? Daxos gain 1 life, Daxos Speaker gain 2 life, play Linden, yeah I can probably get there next turn. Bye, speaker. Okay, so I'm wrong. My opponent isn't a combo deck. They're they're just kind of a control deck of some nature. Um, Sarah's Ascendant is super cool and the sort of thing that I want to be doing. But my mana curve is terrible if I do that. I think I'm playing Linden this turn. And then this attack is free. My opponent can't double block and kill it, so this just gives me a little bit more life. And now, like, Ajani Minus is very good, and Sarah's Ascendant is also quite good. Depends really on whether or not my opponent has to hold back this Dungeon Geist or not. Oh, interesting. They're kicking out the Daxos over the Linden. Uh, well, that's pretty ideal. Uh, 
uh, opponent has given me the nice. Let me tell you, it feels good on my end, too. I think I go ahead and attempt to trade Linden for Dungeon Geists. I have two very large creatures already. And I don't think my opponent will trade. I think they're just going to try to attack me down and get me below 30 life. Because one Dungeon Geist hit does that. Attacking with this, and I'm attacking with this. Am I also attacking with Soul Warden? A lot of damage if my opponent doesn't block. I think I just attack with these two. The Soul Warden's pretty valuable, and I don't know how quickly we're actually going to end this game. Okay, what is this? Okay, so draw three, put two back on top of your library. Okay, I'm very familiar with that sort of effect from Legacy. I don't have a free attack this turn. Oh, that's... That's pretty good. This represents a lot of power in the air, and my opponent might be in the sort of situation where they can just chump block. I Ajani's Pride Mate a couple of times and just kill me in the air, even through my life gain. I fought my hardest. Okay. Um, am I making a token this turn or am I just playing a new Daxos? I'm going to make a new Daxos. Yes. I am aware of what I'm doing. I do appreciate the prompts. I'm going to keep this one. The reason being is that I'm going to get a whole bunch of dies triggers. So this will be 8, 9, 10, 11. My opponent will go to 1 if they don't block this. Which... Probably means that they have to block that. So I'm going to go ahead and alpha in with three creatures here. I have ranked up. Hoping to get a diamond before the end of the month. I don't think it will be overly difficult. I haven't seen a deck quite like my opponent's deck before. Again, I'm still learning Historic. This is only a format that I've been playing for a week or so. 
Um, but I'm encountering a lot of interesting brews or things that I haven't identified as one of the top, top archetypes might be more accurate. I go first. Um, I don't think this hand is good enough. This can gain some life and has an enabler, but not enough life gain to actually get to it consistently. This hand is much stronger. We're going to keep the six and bounce back the redundant Daxos. My opponent is a Luris deck. Claim the firstborn. Okay, okay, so my opponent is going to try to like take control of my stuff and sack it. Got it. Don't think it's worth trading my Soul Warden for Stitcher's Supplier. If the game goes very long, my opponent's Luris will be quite good. Oh, neat. It was a mini reanimate. Well, that's a great draw. Man, this feels kind of like Legacy. It's just like turn two Dreadheart Arcanist, where my opponent can have all of the options. Yikes. So, like, they can get another Stitcher Supplier, which refuels the graveyard. They can get a Blood Chief's Thirst. Uh, I think this straight up beats me right here. I think the way I win is my opponent deciding to just kill my Soul Warden with the Blood Chief's Thirst this turn. And then I can play Daxos into a Johnny's Pride Mate. And they also, like, don't hit anything else good. Alright, they've just put Luris into their hand this turn. Okay, the, the bait was successful. Oh, no, it wasn't. Yeah. So I'm not under a lot of pressure. And the Luris is so good too, though. I'm gonna play double a Johnny's Pride Mate, then one of them gets killed. No, I think I go Daxos a Johnny's Pride Mate. Because this allows me to make a larger as Johnny's Pride Mate. both this turn and next turn. Instead of having two 3-3s, three I have one 4-4 four, four this turn and another 4-4 four, four next turn. Now, the double block is not profitable here because Luris. Um, that's going to be very good in a bit. I think I need to do this one this turn. I think I'm prepared to scoop it up to another one mana removal spell though, because that represents two creature kills in this turn. Like I'd lose this and this and then be empty. Okay. That 
that's fine. Yeah, this is much more fair and historic than it is in Legacy. In Legacy, when this thing untaps, or when this thing untaps and you get a turn cycle or two with it, like, you're just dead. Alright, uh, one, two, three, four, five, so this will enter as a creature. Johnny's Pride Mate is already going to be bigger than their old board. Three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, we're already going to be like that big. So I think I'm going to diversify a bit. So my game plan for this game is actually to crash in with the healer's hawk. I don't know that attacks are super profitable for me, because my opponent just blocks the Stitcher Supplier, fuels their graveyard, and then like for one black mana they have blocked my attack and it's no good. So I'm not sure that I'm actually supposed to attack. So, in good news, that can't be flashed back by Arcanist. And I'm going to go ahead and just play out my lands. Like, I have a Mana Sink in play. And I'm not really bluffing much at this point. Like, this is not the sort of deck that plays instants most of the time. Uh, it's not like me holding a card represents like a Path to Exile or Swords to Plowshares or something of that general caliber. So you're going to try to gain control of my Heliod. I'd like to activate this ability. I don't know why I got the Are You Sure prompt. Oops from my opponent. Hmm. Actually, thinking about it now. Uh, okay, yeah, so my opponent can't sack this because it's not a creature on their side of the battlefield. I see. That's what the oops is for. So my opponent actually can use Fame to bump their Dreadheart Arcanist and then flash back the Devil. Um, so I am actually very much in trouble, and I didn't realize it until now. Uh, 
I am on board with that being in play. Okay, so the Hawk is already lethal next turn. Well, let's maybe grow something else. Um, I want 8 damage in the air next turn, though, if my opponent attacks in with Luris just to stay alive, so maybe I do just continue to grow the Hawk. I just kind of have to hope they don't see the, the devil line. Uh-oh. Sure seems like they saw that line. I think I still put a counter on the healer's hawk this time. Um, the reason being that if my opponent attacks in with Dreadhorde or Canist, going for like a B double thing. And they kill the healer's hawk, then I get to eat the Arcanist in combat, and they can't replay it this turn. Means they can't attack the following turn. So my healer's hawk is dying. I don't have lethal next turn anymore, but the Dreadheart Arcanist is dead. And I'm going to have two very large creatures. And my opponent's attacks are bad. Dreadheart Arcanus did pop back into play. Healer's Hawk is great. Uh, what's the removal like in the graveyard? Um, there is a Bedevil, unfortunately. And a Fame. Uh, order of Operations. Hold on. I am at 48 life. Durr. Yep. I maybe didn't play that one perfectly. I don't remember what my life total was when I first played the Ajani, um, but it's very possible I was just supposed to minus that, or not minus that, zero that immediately. Um, most of the time you're playing that on curve, so you're not anywhere close to that life total for a couple of turns. Mm, yeah, I'm... I probably misplayed that one. I would have to, like, go back and rewatch to, like, see my exact timing. A 
Najani is a one of in my deck, and the mode that I use is almost always the minus two to create Najani's Pride Mate. Um, so I think I just played that one poorly. Um, this hand is very good. As Soul Warden into Najani's Pride Mate into Hollowed Priest and Sarah Ascendant. Generally speaking, I don't think I don't think things have changed here. That's a lot of ramp. Can I get to 27 easily? Yes, I can. I get to 30 easily. So if I just play three creatures, that puts me to 27. Then with Linden next turn, I can be swinging 12 in the air most of the time. Yeah, okay, I like it. It's just kind of like accepting that the Hollowed Priest isn't a part of my, like, game-winning portion of the curve. <clears throat> Alright. What big awful thing do you have for me? Being exactly a 6 6 is a little annoying. I think I'm just willing to trade a Sarah's Ascendant for that without it being a big deal. Linden or Hollowed Priest? Hollowed Priest means that I can create another very, very large creature this turn. Uh, I'll be at 30 life or above either way. I think it's Hollowed Priest. Well, playing Linden is better if I draw a low drop next turn, play a two drop specifically. I'm going to go ahead and play the Linden. Playing the, the Linden just means that this card is going to be lethal on its own if it ever gets through. And I think my opponent has to trade this this turn. So Sarah's Ascendant is now lethal in the air. Okay, yep, and the opponent has scooped it up. I haven't seen a Primal Bounty in play in a long time. I go first. Yeah, uh, this is a spectacular curve of Soul Warden into Pride Mate into Heliod. Uh, we may or may not postpone Heliod a turn. Um, Heliod is better when it enters with Devotion since it triggers your Soul Warden effects that way. 
if I draw another two drop, my turn three is pretty likely to just be like two drop plus speaker rather than just play Heliot onto the empty board. Uh, opponent perhaps having a difficult mulligan decision over there. Very difficult mulligan decision. Going back to... Oh, never mind. We can proceed. Merfolk, huh? I don't know if there's like a 1-1 one, one flash merfolk that I need to worry about. I'm going to assume no and crash in. Uh, yeah, so this is exactly the sort of situation where I was talking about, where we're going to go ahead and play the Hollowed Priest and the Speaker this turn instead of playing the Heliod. The next turn, Heliod is going to enter for Soul Warden, which triggers Heliod. Uh, and my opponent is down a lot of life, and they're playing a blue-green creature deck. Probably does not bode well for them. Yeah. That's about as expected. Just racking up those daily wins. I'm about to get my weekly experience as well. Or rather, I'm about to max out my weekly experience. I go first. Um, this hand is keepable. This hand isn't the nuts. It doesn't have the best one drop option. Um, Sarah Ascendant is probably the worst one drop to play on turn one, despite that the fact that it's usually the best end game one drop. And that's because if my opponent just plays, a, say, a 1-mana 2-2, two, two, I don't get to gain life with this immediately. And then I have, like, a 1-1 one, one after that. And the synergy aspect of my deck uh, goes rather slowly. Uh, a third land drop is really important for this hand. Yeah, this is a, a great example of where uh, a Sarah, uh, Sarah's attendant would be just so much better than what I have going on here. All right. Um, I need to wall the board a little bit. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and play a Daxos here. Again, the, the difference between Sarah's Ascendant, or sorry, Sarah's Attendant or Soul Warden and a Sarah Ascendant here is pretty big. Okay, I don't know what this card does. Power equal to Devotion of Red. Whenever it or another non-token creature dies, you get a 1-1 Satyr that can't block. The creature is big, you get two of them instead. Okay. Seven, three, huh? Okay, I think I'm going double one drop here. <clears throat> uh, and I am not attacking. I am not the beat down here. Okay. How do I deal with this? Combat tricks suck here for me. 
uh, almost universally. I think I'm going to go block with this and block like that, theoretically take five. But I don't think that's actually how things are going to play out. But I don't think I super get to play around things here. Yeah. So this gives double strike, right? Yeah, there's a lot of incoming damage, and I don't have good things to do about that. Just can't block. I can attack in, gain three, create a 4-4 four, four creature, which can trade with this. Okay, so I know I'm doing this. My opponent just moves the Ember Cleave over here, though. Yeah. Good call. Eight. All right, not dead. Not dead is the answer. Eight, nine. Yeah, okay. All right, land would be clutch. Okay, I have picked up a land. By attacking in with three creatures, just sacking one of them to make a gigantic hollowed priest so that I'm not just getting destroyed by the Ember Cleave. Uh, actually, I can just play Heliot. I do have exactly five devotion. Yeah, okay. A removal spell here is brutal. Like, even just removing one of these means that Heliod can't block. Alright, so that goes there. This goes here. Double block. Double block, kill this so that these are less of a threat. And make my Hollowed Priest huge. Then it can gain lifelink. Yes, I like it. Okay, what's the line? I can just gain eight this turn. Um, that's probably fine. Linden baselines are pretty good too. They're a little worse against removal spells. Um, Oh wait, hold on, do I just have lethal? Uh, 6, 14, 15, 16, 17. 6, 14, 15, 16, 17. That's a great opportunity to just point out that sometimes you need to break yourself out of the position like, the frame of thinking that you're in. Because I was so convinced that I was on the defensive there that I didn't consider how much damage I actually had if I just pivoted to the offensive. Um, 
So I'm very happy I realized that and didn't like catch that one when I rewatched the video later. How are we doing on recording time for this? 40 minutes? All right. Let's do one more and then kind of like call that good for a video. The goal of these sorts of things is to just have magic content flowing into the channel um, a little bit more often. It's not always going to be long chunks of content, but I, I want people to have something available to watch most days. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and keep this. My opponent is playing a Luris deck, so they might be trying that red-black thing that we saw one of our play opponents playing previously. Nope, Hollow Fountain. This is a... Uh... Or Oak with Loris? This is some sort of, like, curious obsession sort of deck. Like, draw a bunch of cards, be tempo -y. Oh, auras. All right, I have solved the puzzle. Uh, Daxos, Priest. I think it's Priest. Attack is free. I have not played against Oros before, so I don't know which things I need to be playing around. Um, but if Daybreak Coronet is legal, I'll have some things to worry about. Oh, right, this can't be blocked, I see. Uh, I guess I'm just taking that. Are you vigilant? That gives vigilance. Um, that's a nuisance. That means Linden's not particularly good here. Um, and I very much have a real problem. And that problem is that this can be sacrificed to give pro-white. And then this thing can be forced through for damage. But I guess pro-white would mean that some of these auras fall off. Uh, are we in jump block territory? Might be in chump lock territory. It makes my hollowed priest larger. Like maybe we can get the hollowed priest to the point where it can challenge this. Not at enough life or anywhere close to enough life where I can just like brute force get to 35 and nuke their board. Um. I think we're going to save this for a little while. Wouldn't battle in with the healer's hawk. If I can trade two bodies for Scorpion for Spirit Dancer, I would be ecstatic. Eh, it's getting big. It's getting big quickly. Fun is also starting to diversify. Alright, I think this one has slipped away. It could be wrong, though. All right, so opponent is tapped out. Oh, uh, this is an 810? Deal? Linden? Daxos? Maybe Daxos? Um, 
They're both legendary. Throw away London. It's just like a Johnny plus try to protect. Uh, I can't super protect it well. If it goes to six. This thing's not going to be good at getting in. Yeah. All right. Maybe I'm not out of this yet. There is no greater treasure than quiet times with friends. Find your strength. Uh. I can also send in this 11-11 and force a chump block. Uh, maybe it doesn't force a chump block, but it's a huge chunk of damage. Drawing too many cards, I can't see what your cards do. Please. Plus one, plus zero. Oh. Okay. Okay, that's pretty good. All right. So opponent went at me rather than finishing off the planeswalker. Presumably means that they can just kill me next turn through something like Energiani activation. Alright, so, yes, I know. in with this and that. Oh, that creature is going to be big. I don't know if it's going to be 24 big, but it's going to be close. Like every enchantment that goes on after that is now like plus two plus two. Uh oh. It has to be two more. Or one of those. One of those does it. That is a, a rather drastic difference in size. Good game. I think my opponent could have played that one a little bit differently to have me dead a greater proportion of the time. Uh, so for example, if I had topped a Heliod and had been able to get my big creature lifelink, uh, I think I end up in a better position. Uh, okay, let's pull up the deck real quick to wrap things up. Um, I definitely like having the Healer's Hawks over the Alsaids, or however I'm supposed to pronounce that. Um, I think that was a good change. I I might want to try a second Ajani Strength of the Pride. The deck's really streamlined and efficient now. But, like... As we saw in one of the later games, the ability to just like nuke my opponent's board when I've gotten way, way ahead on life is really strong. So maybe junking one of the Sarah Ascendants for another Ajani Strength of the Pride is a reasonable decision. 
Maybe I'll do that when I uh, open some packs and get another Mythic Wild card. Anyway, folks, I hope you're enjoying this. If you have any like comments or suggestions for this deck, please let me know. Um, using this as kind of a budget entry point to Historic. And then as I accrue Magic uh, Arena resources, I'll consider buying another deck. Um, and if you're really enjoying my content, you know, like, subscribe, comment, that sort of stuff uh, helps other people find my content easier. Have a great rest of the day.